Let me begin by expressing my gratitude to Professor Rosengard and everyone at the Asia Center uh, for having me back and helping me reintegrating into the Harvard community, as well as uh, uh, the students here, as well as all of you that come to listen to me talk. Again, it's a topic that is very close to my heart, the future of Thailand. We can think about this as a continuation of my appearance last year. Last year was about moving Thailand forward. It was exactly on October 26th, and today is October 22nd, so we missed that by about four days. I think we should make this an annual event every year, <laughs> because I have nine years to spare. <laughs> So, but it's going to be, there's going to be some similarities and some differences as well, because last year uh, I was still a, a, a member of parliament uh, on suspension um, because I, uh, uh, they blocked me from becoming a prime minister and they slapped a case on me which I'm happy to report that I won in December, two months after I met with you guys, and then I returned to the parliament, but then they came back with a bigger hammer and dissolved the party and banned me for 10 years. So for this time, it's not gonna be about moving Thailand forward or something political because I'm no longer a politician. I'm a visiting scholar. So this time it's gonna be more academics and it's going to be exactly what the topic is talking about, the future of Thailand. And my objective for the for this one hour that we have together is that I become a bridge between Thailand and Harvard. We're going to be talking about the future, which is a synthesis of my past experience as member of parliament, and also the future of hypotheses of how we fix that. Professor Rosenberg started off you know, giving you the answer of what the future of Thailand looks like in a sentence. It's going to be comfortable for few, but crisis for most. What he left out is that there are some suggested solutions and some strategies that can turn that into competitive for all. It doesn't have to be comfort for few, crisis for most, but also can be competitive for all. So I'm not just going to you know, talk about problems that Thailand has or what I had experienced during my term as a parliament, but I'm also offering solutions and doing a deep dive on what the crisis means. And obviously, you know, a lot of family faces from Harvard, some from Boston University, some came from Brown, some came all the way from New York. Let's co-talk together. So use this as a platform and think about how we can turn Thailand to be a uh, competitive for all. But before I Go into the detail. I come from Kennedy School. Uh, before I, we go into the details, we have to understand our audiences first before we speak. That's that's what you know politicians do. We have to understand you guys first. Uh, so who's been to Thailand? Uh, please show of hands. Who hasn't been to Thailand? <laughs> Who hasn't been to Thailand once ago? Okay, you guys are on my personal list. Next time you visit. Text me and I'll give you a personal <laughs> but, but yeah, I didn't want to discriminate by nationalities who's Thai and who's not Thai because this is Harvard inclusion, diversity is very important to us so that I know how to balance uh, the talk. Uh, it's going to be about one hour. I'm going to be talk doing the talking for about 40 minutes based on this agenda. It's going to be about you know Thailand's future giving you a broad brush, some context for people who might not have been to Thailand or who might not know Thailand so well. Uh, the second part of the talk, we'll do, we'll do a deep dive on the crisis. What do I mean by crisis? I'm gonna spell out what crisis for Thailand uh, has to face in the future. We're gonna talk some next steps uh, that, you know, this is hopefully, I was only joking about the annual thing, I'll be here for this semester and some of next semester, and hopefully we have some more engagement going forward with the Thai community and also the Asian community and general public at large here in Boston and, and New England as well. So I'm going to start off with a takeaway, just in case you fall asleep and you don't get, you know, the first page 
it's really the answer of today's talk. Comfort for few and crisis for most. What do I mean by that? And how do I come up with that numbers? It's not something that is personal to me, but we go to the, the, a neutral country in Switzerland. There's two reports that comes out from Swiss banks. The first one is on the right side of me, that's by UBS, uh, the, the Swiss investment bank. On the left of, of me, there's some information from the Credit Suisse, uh, which no longer is no longer with us, but they did some report <laughs> on this uh, uh, inequality. So on this side, you see right here by the U.S. report, which came out last month, it says <laughs> that Thailand is number nine in terms of number of millionaires. Currently, we have in 2023, we have about a hundred thousand millionaires in Thailand. In five years. 2028, that number is going to increase by about 24%. We are number nine in terms of growth of millionaires, even ahead of Singapore. So if you are the top 1% or if you're the elites, it's going to be pretty cozy for you going forward. It's not it's going to be good. You're going to be holding a lot of uh, uh, land and properties and all those things that uh, you accumulate in your wealth. Not, not a problem, growing by... 25% where the GDP is growing about 2% sort of thing. But on the left side, most of Thais will still suffer. In terms of wealth distribution, the wealthiest 1% of Thais own about 67% of the wealth. Let me be clear again. Up 1%, according to Credit Suisse, holds 67% of the wealth in terms of inequality. Give you a bit of a context, uh, during that year when they study, Russia, India, and Thailand. So Thailand is number three. For those of you who visit been to Thailand as a tourist, you probably enjoy the paradise and everything like that. But if you are a native Thai living outside of Bangkok in rural areas, it's going to be pretty tough for you in terms of wealth, inequality, income equality, um, resources inequality, policy core inequality, the ability to access to politicians who make laws and, and things like that. Second point is on the land ownership. 10% holds 61% of Thailand's private land. Only the private land. The government holds also 40% of the land. That's quite a large number. In the US, I checked very quickly, the federal land of America is about 20, 25%-ish. So the government of Thailand, the army and things like that holds a large portion of land. But for the private side, top 10% holds 61%. If you are the bottom 10%, you own 0.07% of the land ownership. If you're at the bottom of the pyramid, 10%, again, you hold 0.07% of the land ownership. And without any land, you can't go to the bank and collateral, right? I mean, for those people in this room, you probably have some sort of land ownership. When you go to the bank and you want to collateral out and you get that credit line out, you better start a business or a mortgage or even you know, get your funding to come to Harvard. But a lot of people don't have that kind of this, that uh, privilege. So land justice is something that when I was a member of parliament, I was trying to push very much because I think that's like the first button of, of your shirt. If you do it right, the other things will come. Financial inclusion will come. Savings will come. Innovation will come. But this is something like the British Revolution or the French Revolution was talking about back in the day. The right to land is something that is very crucial in Thailand. If you look at bank accounts, the top 1% of the accounts holds 70% of the total deficit. So if there's 100 baht in the Thai banking system, just 1% of that volume account holds 70 baht. Imagine that. I mean, and if you are, you know, the remaining 99, <laughs> that's like you only have like thirty percent of that uh, bank account. So just this one slide, I hope it gives you a context of the stark inequality that Thailand faces by a Swiss bank, a neutral country. So I didn't make this up. I'm not here to like talk down on my own country, but this this is the numbers that they are showing to you. If you're that top one percent, you're gonna grow about twenty five percent by within five years. But if you are at the 99 or not, not in that list, you're going to be very, uh, very 
very much suffering in terms of you know the ability to have your own asset as well as you know the kind of cash flows or liquidity that you'll be able to survive uh, in the geopolitical uh, environment that the world is operating right now. Now, is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. That's fine. I've, I've done it before, so don't worry about it. But it was a student also. And also, so inequality is still a stubborn factor in political economy in Thailand going forward. Something that is quite specific to Thailand. Now, what does it mean for the entire country? So I'm showing you a slide here of our GDP growth back until 1993 until 2023. And then you started to see some resistance to, to grow. Huh? You started to see some inertia. You started to see that, you know, back in 1993 to 1997, before the Tom Yang Kung crisis, we were growing by about 7.25%. That's on the, the right side of me at the very right side in terms of real GDP. And then after the financial crisis, we started to recover and grew back a little bit. And that growth rate of that period of time that we enjoyed was about 4.83%. And then the subprime crisis happened. That's when I was here. At, I was here um, at the Kennedy School when hamburger crisis happened. And then we started to recover and grew by about 3%. And now we are about 2%. So from seven, starting to plateau to four something, three something, and then two something. So that's that's Thailand when you compare it from the past and to the present. And when you compare it to a, a, a bigger picture, yesterday IMF announced their forecasts in terms of economic growth. The world output will be about 3.2%. The US will grow by about 2.7%. And Thailand will grow by about 2.1%. So very much this slide shows you that a developing country like Thailand is growing at about a developed country growth trajectory. Philippines is growing by four or five. Indonesia is doing four or five. Vietnam is doing maybe six or seven. So as a developing country, we should be growing about that area with our peers in Southeast Asia. But the truth is we are growing at the age of Singapore, at the, at the pace of Singapore. We're going on a pace of, of America, which is already a developed country. So because this kind of inequality, you know, if I'm a leader and I have a, this is a country and we have about 300 people here, I want to be able to include all of you in my strategy. I don't want just the top four to take care of the economy and, and grow the country or use them as a competitive advantage of the country. I want to be able to include everyone so that you're part of my national strategy as a leader of the country so that, you know, we can be competitive with any other countries around ASEAN, around Asia, around the world. But that's not the case anymore because, you know, the top 1% wants to hold the resources to themselves and leave the, the remaining 99 to to be like up in the air. So that's why the economy is not growing anymore and it's plateauing and plateauing. And that's going to hit uh, finally if we don't do something about it, if we leave it as a status quo. So yeah, so now just in two slides, you, you have some numbers of the inequality problem. And also, you know about the overall national trajectory of what is going to be uh, as of now in 2023, 24, and what can be expected in the future. Now we're going to spell out, you know, going forward, the future of Thailand when it comes to crisis, spell it out. What, what does it mean exactly by crisis? And that's crisis to me. Crisis, when you spell it out, C is for climate. R is for reskilled. I is for innovation. S is super aging society. I is infrastructure. S is state reform. I mean, so what's probably going through your mind is that if we're not talking about Thailand, you're thinking about your own country, that's probably the same kind of crisis for you, right? But I'm not going to be generic because in each of the in, in each of the pillar, when I talk about climate, I'm going to talk I'll be talking about Thai specific issues, Thai specific data. And then the page that follows that issue 
will be what I think the vision for Thailand should be. You know, we are turning crisis into opportunity here. We are turning crisis into an industry here. We are turning crisis into the competitiveness of our country here. So it's going to be like that. It's going to be two page for climate, two page for reskill, two page for innovation. And once we finish that, you have the picture of what is going to be if we leave it, leave Thailand as it is, as a status quo. If we do nothing about it, this is what it's going to look like. But then again, I'm not just here just to complain or moan. I'm trying to hypothesize and turning challenges and weakness of our country into strength and opportunities as well. I think we go through the climate one and then you probably start to understand what I'm trying to frame and what I'm trying to, to talk with you guys today. In terms of climate, Thailand is the fifth most vulnerable to climate impact in the world. If you're from Thailand or you just visited Thailand up north, you see how brutal, how severe, how frequent it has become. You know, it's a flash flood that's coming down very quickly. And then in a couple of month, months, it will be a, a forest fire. So, you know, our beloved destination that we love to go in Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, you know, it's something that you will probably miss out for about seven to eight months out of that one year because there will be flash flood, because it will be uh, forest fire coming from uh, within the area and also the neighboring countries because they want to do deforest uh, in order to, to, to grow animal feed corn, for example. So that's uh, an issue that the country is facing. Uh, to the slide, again, I refer to the Swiss Re Institute, which is an insurance company in Switzerland. They do a list on, on climate risk all around the world. Southeast Asia is very prone to climate risk, and Thailand is number five on that list. They quantify the impact of climate risk to the Thai economy. We are